Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is a place for all things sci-fi and fantasy, with a special emphasis on that most wonderful of all science fiction subgenres, steampunk, which blends in the past history with the future. Today we will be talking about that, that uh, medium that Mrs. Desperado and I love so much, anime, which is another word for Japanese animation. And uh, Japanese, in Japan, animation, that is cartoons, are not just for kids, they're also for adults, which doesn't necessarily mean, I'm not talking about pornography here, <laughs> although some of them do have a little bit of an erotic angle to them. I'm talking about, you know, serious mature themes like war and death and crime and so on. And this makes them very, very fascinating. And uh, I'll get into a little bit more why we love anime so much in just a moment. But first, before we get started, before we get started, I'd like to talk about one of my own published works, Fidelio's Automata. And uh, I have a number of books available on Amazon, and some of them in uh, physical form you can get if you like the hard copy. Uh, everything's available, of course, in uh, ebook, and uh, eventually I would like to get into audiobook, and we'll talk more about that in a future episode. But anyway, Fidelio's Automata is the story of a Cuban genius who, in 1901, he leaves his native Havana and comes to America to make his fortune and, and also to uh, promote his invention, which is a mechanical spider. His whole idea is to revolutionize uh, mining and industry so people don't get killed. <laughs> and he meets uh, Edison, he meets Tesla, has a lot of adventures, and his adventure gets, uh, his, and, and, excuse me, not adventure, his invention gets hijacked and used for nefarious purposes. And so, I, this was my first steampunk uh, novel, and I think, I think you'll really enjoy it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we have a lot of themes you don't normally see in steampunk, and so please check it out. So, and a shout out to Richard Meyer of Comics Matter, uh, the YouTube channel, for driving it into my head that I always need to be promoting my stuff, which is what he does on every one of his reviews. And so I'm going to follow his example. Back to our regularly scheduled video. So, Mrs. Desperado and I have been fans of anime for like 10 years now, and we've become rather intensive fans. Uh, my son got me started, and uh, anime has really captivated us, and partly because uh, the stories are so good, and the themes are, are often stuff that you won't see in American entertainment. And the coolest thing about anime is it's not woke. It's not woke. The Japanese don't worry about, you know, things like racial justice and history of oppression and stuff. I mean, occasionally they can address these things if they feel like it, but they're not obligated. I mean, Japan's a homogenous society, and so the most part, for the most part, they just produce good stories. But and they're proud of people, too, which, is, which I also love about the Japanese. They don't, you know, they don't beat themselves up about their mistakes. Everybody has made mistakes every country has. So, without further ado, uh, I'll get into my list. Now, first of all, I'm going to restrict myself to the last 25 years, uh, partly because uh, the technology of animation has improved so much and I, that, you know, the older stuff's hard to watch, frankly, and even great works uh, like Akira that were written at the end of the 1980s, I don't really like the 1980s anima animation style. Not, not a big fan. And uh, so I want to leave out, also I'm going to leave out full length, for the most part, full length uh, movies like uh, all Miyazaki's wonderful works. We like stuff that tends to be kind of mature themed, uh, often rather violent, and uh, not slice of life, and not all these like middle school teenage things that everybody, that they like so much in Japan, uh, but more stuff that's adventurous and exciting. I mean, there's tons of like sports animes and so on, and, and my son likes some of those, but not on our list. And not really any of the shonen stuff that uh, has been so over, overworked uh, in, in this country, like Bleach, for example. 
that uh, you know frankly are made for kids. That's that's fine. That's that's a that's a that's their purpose. But these are made typically for more serious audience. Even a lot of them have children as protagonists, or they have may have a little bit of a, a cutesy art style. Even so, I they're not one of these would I recommend for you know for children for like grade school age children. Although most of them are probably okay for high schoolers because they're they're a little bit more uh, mature themes. So beginning with number ten, we have Made in Abyss, and uh, in all of these, I'm going to go through the creator, which I consider to be usually it's the person who wrote the manga because typically these start with a manga, you know, the, the written form and the uh, paper form, and uh, get made into a video. Sometimes not. Sometimes they are go conceived as anime, but most of the time, because the manga person, the manga artist, writer created the sh created the thing, I'll list them as the creator. So, starting out with that, uh, starting out with the the title, the uh, creator, the studio, and the years, and uh, trying to make this a little quicker. So, starting out with Made in Abyss, we ha have it was a manga by Akito Tsukushi. And this studio was Kinema Citrus, and this was shown in 2017 and 2020. 2020, it was released as kind of a feature length, uh, feature length uh, thing. But I think you know, I think that's partly because of COVID. The, their industry was kind of uh, impacted by that, and therefore it's not. And therefore, it's. Uh, I think it would have been released as a series otherwise. This has a very interesting premise with a very unique setting. Uh, the abyss is a giant hole in the middle of the earth. And it's, uh, the city has grown up around it. And all these treasure hunters go down because there's all these artifacts to find. It's dangerous. There's monsters down there. There are evil people down there. And there's physical dangers you could fall. <laughs> and there's also, worst of all, there's the curse of the abyss. Which is there's this weird force down there that provides light, you know, even though it's well below the surface, you still have light, so the sunlight. And this force, if you if you go down for a while and come back up, it mutates your body and turns you into a monster or kills you or something like that. So that's that as an added complication to that. And this the hero is an orphan girl named Rico, and you can see from the art that she's very She's a very spunky little gal. You have to root for her. You have to love her with her, with her glasses and stuff. Or, and she is going to find her mother, who is a abyss uh, adventurer, a uh, treasure hunter, who is presumed dead, but R Rico believes she's alive. Luckily, she meets a robot boy, a mysterious robot boy named Reg. He helps her. He has certain powers that can defend her, although well, they have their limits. And they go down, they, they, they battle monsters, and they encounter some horrible vill villains, one who is very reminiscent of Darth Vader, and also we risk the curse of the abyss. Uh, not Reg, because he's a robot, but there's always this worry about Rico. And they meet some interesting characters, including the famous bunny girl, uh, Nanachi. And she was... Uh, she was a normal girl, and for some reason, the Curse of Abyss changed her into a human bunny rabbit, which she was lucky, uh, you know, not made in a blob. But her, the curse is that every human wants to pet her because she's got this fur. She says, no, no, don't touch me! <laughs> so, you know, so there's a lot of tragedy. Uh, there's, there's funny humor. There's some uh, body horror, uh, you know, people being turned into blobs and stuff, which is, some people don't like that. But in general, a wonderful show with some wonderful characters and some heart-rending and some heart-pumping heart action, let's say. Number nine. Got to try and get a little bit quicker with this. There's so much to say about each one. Number nine is one that's very popular and it's been done multiple times. Uh, kind of a shonen, but I love it anyway. A Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Hagane no Rinkinjutsushi. Uh, based on the uh, manga by Hiromu Arakawa, done by Studio Bones in uh, 2009 and 2010. This was a reboot of an earlier version from 2003. 
And the reason I like this version better is because its art style is more mature. I didn't really watch much of that earlier one. They, they, they're kind of what they call chibi, which means that they're cute. But the action is very dark and, and very, you know. And so it's more appropriate that, that, that they have a realistic art style. And it involves the brothers Elric, uh, Edward and Alphonse. They are alchemists, which is kind of a hereditary power in this magical kingdom of Amnistris. And they encounter a curse. Their mother dies of a disease, and they try to resurrect her from the dead, which is forbidden. And the curse backfires on them, and uh, one loses his arm and leg, literally, and he has to have them replaced with mechanic mechanicals. And the other, it becomes a, suit of, a living suit of armor, because his body's gone, and they affix him onto that. So he's like this giant robot. And there's all these wonderful characters, many of them, I know, many of them allied to the, the brothers, because they're in the service of the government, the, the alchemist, alchemist corps, whatever, and the, the evil characters are like the seven deadly sins, they're homunculi, they're personifications of that, and uh, including this rather sinister leader of the country, Fuhrer President King Bradley. <laughs> he doesn't have enough titles on his name, does he? Uh, so, uh, 64 episodes, but worth every, worth watching every one, definitely. Uh, number eight, Black Butler, and also called Kuro Shijitsu. And this is based on a manga by Yana Toboso, and uh, from the uh, animation from AI Pictures, 2008 to, through 10. And with some extra episodes in 2014, this was insanely popular in Japan. And this is Mrs. Death Auto's favorite. And it takes place in Victorian England. And there's this demon named Sebastian. He's the titular character. He's not African. He just has dark hair. And, and black, in this case, means he's uh, kind of evil. <laughs> Yet, he's, a good, yeah, he's also a good guy. Because he rescues this uh, orphaned aristocrat named C.L., uh, from these cultists who wouldn't sacrifice him, and uh, he's he's becomes CL's protector. At the same time, there's this understanding that eventually he will claim CL's soul. And so there's a dark undercurrent. There's a lot of really funny, dark humor in this, and 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 though the character's a child, it's not for children. Definitely not. There's lots of uh, dark things going on here, you know, zo including zombies and vampires and so on. And also there's my, uh, Mr. Desperado's favorite character was C.L.'s fiance. I know he's only 10, but he's, a, he's engaged. This wealthy, snooty girl named Elizabeth. And yet she turns out to not be what she seems. She turns out to be a lot more of a uh, self-assured, strong woman than we actually suspected. So again, highly recommend it. Number seven, I did a show on this one, and I forgot to publish it. I didn't edit it, I didn't get it ready, but I will eventually publish it. Because it was kind of a, kind of a steampunkish one. I think I mentioned it on a previous list. Last Exile, based on the manga, which kind of came out at the same time. So I think this was one of them, the ones that was conceived as an anime. By Gonzo, <laughs> Studio Gonzo. But I guess that's probably a creative team. 2016-2012. This is a diesel punk. And diesel punk being, uh, like steampunk, only it takes place more like the 1920s style and culture with 1920s style and technology. And this adventure actually takes place in the far future, a human colony world called Prester. And it stars these two teenage orphans, Klaus and Lobby, who inherit this aircraft that their fathers used to use for their business. And it's a it's a van ship. It's a magnetic, like a magnetic airplane. <laughs> That's it's a little easier to fly because it, 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 you know, you don't have to worry about the wings. It holds itself up. And they're couriers. And there's this war going on. There's all these giant airships battling. It's really cool. And there are a lot of really, you know, awesome old-timey uniforms uh, made. And uh, against this backdrop, they you know, meet a lot of interesting characters. And they take up with this renegade airship that wants to stop these wars. Uh, the sequel, called uh, Fan the Silver Wing, takes place when some of these uh, colonists go back to Earth, and uh, there are these two girls who are air pirates. And as cute as they are, it's not as believable. 
I mean, not that this isn't kind of fantastic to begin with, but I just don't see, you know, I just don't see these, these teenage girls as willing to kill. But as a pirate, you have to be willing to kill, right? Uh, next is one I've already done a, uh, done a, I uh, already did a video about this alone because it's so cool and historically interesting called Golden Kamui based on the manga by Sotaro Noda from studio, from the Gino studio, 2018 to 2020. And uh, it's a historical based adventure and it won a uh, award for spotlighting the culture of the Ainu people. Now, I know I've talked about Japan as being homogenous, but they do have one minority. <laughs> the Ainu, they're indigenous people, kind of like the Native Americans. <clears throat> They've been pushed up to the northernmost island, Hokkaido. The protagonist is the war veteran from the Russo-Japanese War, early 1900s, uh, Immortal Sugumoto. He's called Immortal because he survived against all odds in these horrific battles. And his Ainu sidekick, a teenage girl named Aserpa. She's kind of counter to Aserpa, uh, the Ainu society in that she's a hunter. She not she hasn't you know she's not just you know raising the crops and and cooking. She's a hunter, and <clears throat> so she teaches she teaches uh, Sugumoto a lot about their culture. And this is against the backdrop of this treasure that Sugumoto is trying to find, this gold that was supposedly stolen from the Ainu. And so she want, they just want to restore it to her people, but there's other people who are looking for this gold for themselves. It's been called the Japanese Western because we have a lot of the same things. We have a disgruntled war veteran, we have corrupt military officials, we have hunt for treasure, we have ruthless criminals, and we have natives who are wise with the uh, lore of nature. And uh, for this reason, it, it received a, 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 an award. For this reason, it, it received an award for spotlighting Ainu culture. And it's got some violent moments. It's got some horror elements in place, so beware of that. Mostly historically uh, believable, but there's some weird black magic going on at, at the place. There's a, there's a mad scientist who is transgender. <laughs> uh, he... Uh, transforms himself into a beautiful woman by consuming the flesh of young women. <laughs> so, uh, so it's not for the faint-hearted, but it's it's and it's got a lot of weird, uh, off-kilter, inappropriate Japanese humor. Nonetheless, I loved it. Number five, uh, the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, and this is a light novel uh, from a light, light novel based on by Nagaru Tanagawa and an anime by, excuse me, a manga by Makota Mizumo, and uh, published by Kyoto Animation 2006. Uh, tragically, I believe this is the studio that was burned down by this uh, psychopathic, disgruntled creator, uh, killing a number of people uh, a, a couple years ago. I'll have to uh, confirm that. Uh, but. Uh, Haruhi, the title character, is a high school girl. She's this ordinary, cute, popular high school girl uh, who unknowingly, even to herself, has godlike powers. Now, she's kind of like an X-Files person. She says she's only interested in, you know, people with uh, psychic powers, aliens, robots, uh, witches and warlocks. I don't remember. <laughs> but anyway, the funny thing is that all her friends are secretly these things, except for one, Kyon. He's a normal boy who kind of becomes embroiled in this. Their purpose is to keep her happy, because she has. If she gets mad, she her fit of temper could literally destroy the universe. She can rend space and time. <laughs> That's an interesting premise. Uh, and, and the second season has a weird Groundhog Day like theme for several episodes, so don't say we didn't warn you. <laughs> I I appreciated it because I just kept saying, how far are they going to go with this? Because she keeps rewinding time because she ha she wants the summer to go a particular way, and until it does, they're going to just keep repeating. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's very unique and creative. It's wonderful, and they had this weird little dance that was really popular among anime fans that all the, they showed the characters doing at the beginning of the episode or the end, I forget. 
Number four, here's a cult classic that I particularly love, and a few people know about it, and I want to promote it as much as possible. It's called The Eccentric Family. In, Japan, in Japanese, it's Ochutun Kazoku. And this is based by a light novel slash manga by Tomohiko Morimi, and uh, the studio is PA Works, uh, seasons of 2013 and 2017. In Japanese legend, the Tanuki, otherwise called raccoon dogs, they're literally a wild dog, like a fox or something. They look like cute raccoons. They're viewed as tricksters, kind of like the Native Americans view the coyote. And in, in Japanese legend, they can assume human form and, and do play, play all these pranks. Well, this follows a Tanuki family who live as humans in modern Kyoto. And they get into all sorts of trouble. The father, as a matter of fact, uh, got accidentally eaten by a human, by a club of, of uh, what do we call, epicures? Uh, that, you know, humans that like to do these various dishes and they had to have tanuki hot pot for Christmas or for the New Year's. <laughs> and uh, so these all these weird characters, the main character is Yasaburo. He's, a, he's the third of a family of four boys. And he sometimes appears as a cute teenage girl because he can. <laughs> And he has this weird relationship with this human woman named Ben Ten, who is kind of sinister. We get the we get the message that she's she's um, partly responsible for for the death of As Asaburo's Yasaburo's father, and also she's trying to steal magic powers from this Tengu, who's a bird man, another Japanese legend. He's this crotchety old uh, eccentric man who is like their teacher, the the, the Tanuki's teacher. And he's another fun character too. Very, uh, very funny uh, and touching because this family goes through a lot, and you really, you really, uh, you know, sometimes it'll bring tears to your eyes. It's it's so cool. Number three, Kill la Kill, another insanely popular show among anime cultists, uh, based on a manga by Ryo Akazuki, uh, and also there's a screenwriter Kazuki Nakashima. Uh, from Trigger, 2013 to 15, I almost hesitate to recommend this because in today's really insanely puritanical climate, it involves teenage girls battling in what amounts to string bikinis. <laughs> uh, it's partly a, a satire on um, anime tropes. And so that's, that's one of it. It's like the magical girl theme and what we call fan service, which is having sexy characters. Uh, gratuitously sexy, because uh, there's no reason to fight in the string bikini. <laughs> Which, what these are is these are power suits that that uh, are alive, but when they get into battle mode, they become very scanty for whatever reason. They start looking like a schoolgirl uniform, school uniform, and become very scanty, which is ri ridiculous. That, that that's part of a that's you know that's a an anime trope. The uh, Hero is a um, is a girl is a tough girl named Ryoko, and she's I have seen fetish <laughs> fetish stuff on the internet for her. She's so she's she's so she's such a uh, badass girl, <laughs> uh, and uh, of people of girls dressing like her basically, and she's out to avenge her father's death. She carries this giant scissors, which she. Uh, half a scissor, which she wields like a sword, and she's battling this evil fascist high school, <laughs> and uh, that uh, is organized like an army, and especially the school president, who is another another uh, attractive young girl, and uh, her, um, I think his name was Satsuki, and her school uniform is is alive. Is called a kamui of all things, and it's called kenset, ken, senketsu, and it talks to her, and it gives her strength to battle. But at the same time, it, he becomes very skimpy when she's battling, which is very stupid, but hilarious. The, there's insanely over-the-top violence, just ludicrous, and uh, these the, this whole they they have this pun on fashion because the fashion industry has this has this conspiracy to produce these suits. And the and the, and the uh, school is fascist. <laughs> Even the marching band—they have weapons, you know. And so, 
it's it, it's just just take it as a satire and uh, being kind of mocking all these anime tropes and uh, you know maybe you won't be offended by it too much number two here's one that was also super insanely popular in um, in America and it, a few years ago you might have seen these black notebooks that uh, students were carrying around it was called Death Note uh, from a manga by Tsugumi Oba illustrated by Takashi Obata and uh, the studio was Madhouse 2006-2007 uh, it involves a brilliant teenager called Light Bigami he's like top of his class etc in Japan and he finds this magic notebook and there's this death god, he's kind of a Japanese Grim Reaper, uh, called Ryuk, who uh, leaves this as a prank to mess with humans. And this gives him the power to, to write anybody's name in the book and kill them at a distance. And so he can murder with impunity. And first he starts by eliminating violent criminals. And then pretty soon, when he realizes that the government is on to him, he starts murdering police. <laughs> and then there's this brilliant teenage detective uh, named L, who's trying to find him. L has to remain, remain, remain anonymous, otherwise, like you kill him. <laughs> so that's the, the and anonymity is their only defense against this guy. They, if, if you don't, if he doesn't know your name, he can't kill you. And, and uh, a lot of people have uh, have uh, criticized the second season for being slow. I thought it was tense. I, I thought there was a lot of tension, and uh, uh, so I enjoyed it as well. The thing is, how, how can you stop this guy? I mean, that's the challenge. He, his ultimate power, he has absolute power, and it corrupts him absolutely. It really says a lot about human nature. And it got made into a, a Japanese version, two full-length movies, which were okay, kind of true to the spirit. Uh, and an American version that was aired on Netflix uh, a couple years ago that was horrifically bad. Oh my god, it was awful. Not worth watching at all, unfortunately. So while well, well, we've got one more left, I'm going to go with the honorable mentions. As if we don't have, a, as if we haven't talked about enough here. And these are all Mrs. Desperado's favorites, which are kind of my favorites too. So it's hard for me not to mention them in some capacity. So, first of all, ex Holic. Uh, from Production IG 2006 to 2008. And this involves a teenage boy in modern day Japan who suffers from visions of spirits, which are all around him, but most people can't see them. And he seeks help from this witch, this sultry lady here. Um, and she, um, what's her name? Uh, Yuko, yeah. And uh, she counsels people with problems with it. And hence the ex holic, which involves which implies addiction, but she's kind of a boozer herself, so it's kind of, it's kind of ironic, I guess. Uh, the next one is Mushishi, uh, which was uh, Mrs. Desperado's first anime that she really loved uh, from Artland, 2005 to 2006, also 2014. And this is set in pre-industrial Japan, and the show follows a man who travels the country exercising spirits. And he actually just wants to talk, toss them out. He doesn't he doesn't want to destroy them, um, but they get in the way. They're called Mushi, and so he's a Mushishi. He's a Mushi exorcist, and uh, it's the art style is beautiful, and uh, the stories are interesting. They get a little repetitive after a while, but it's it's very it's very fun. He's an interesting character. He's always got a cigarette in his mouth because uh, Mushi don't like smoke. <laughs> you couldn't do this in American anime. Oh my God, you're promoting smoking. No. <laughs> but it, it's it's uh, it is it's one of the more unique ones, one of the one of the more special ones. Uh, next couple, Ancient Magus Bride. This one came out at, in theaters a while back, but it was a it was a series and came out from Wit Studio, 2017 to 2018. And this involves a, a very unhappy, uh, abused teenage girl uh, who sells herself to a British wizard, and he's kind of a this weird humanoid. He's like hundreds of years old and he's got the head of a dead deer. <laughs> it's kind of a Japanese takeoff on Beauty and the Beast and it's very interesting. Uh, and uh, kind of, it's a, it's a love story, but it's kind of a weird love story. And the last one, Flowers of Evil. Now this is, is amazing. Uh, Akuna Hana and uh, a little different. There's no magic involved in this one, no sci-fi. 
but it's a psychological thriller. And it's based on a manga by Shusho Oshimi, uh, the, the uh, studio Zexies from 2013. It involves a middle school boy, kind of a bookworm, and he's also obsessed with this popular girl in his class, and he, he steals her gym clothes. <laughs> Another girl catches him doing that, and she's kind of disturbed. She's kind of mentally ill, and she ends up blackmailing him. Uh, she's going to expose him, and so she forces him to do all these these weird uh, pranks, and uh, and gets him increasingly increasingly demented things she forces him to do, and, and it's very it's very disturbing, but it's fascinating, kind of a Hitchcockian, and. Uh, Again, one of the more uh, unique in the version. Last but not least, number one, number one on a lot of people's uh, and many many people's uh, list, Cowboy Bebop. Cowboy Bebop. <laughs> uh, uh, creator was Hajime Yatate, as well as the director Shinichiro Watanabe had a lot of creative input. So this was, again, this was a it's conceived as anime. I think there was a manga simultaneously. Uh, first, in, first came out in 1998, uh, and also uh, 20, 2001 there was a, a feature-length movie version of it that was a sequel. And this is classic space opera. It's set in the year 2071. It's about a pair of down-in-their-luck bounty hunters who have the spaceship. And they travel the solar system, uh, catching bad guys and collecting fellow outcasts for their crew. It has just really quirky, memorable characters and great jazz soundtracks. Uh, it, it's interesting because, like, the sequel takes place on Mars, and Mars has been partly terraformed because Earth has been destroyed by, I don't know, war or disaster, something to do with the moon blowing up. And so, and yet, it's weird because these Martian cities, they look like America in the 1970s. <laughs> you have all these gruffy looking characters wandering around, cigarettes hanging out of their mouths, and and uh, a lot of soul and R&B type uh, original music. It's pretty cool. Now the main bond hunters is Tough Guy and Jet Black, former cop. Then we have Spike Spiegel, who's a kind of a con man who knows martial arts. And they pick up this sexy girl named Faye Valentine, who's also good at uh, getting bad guys. She has her own little Little, little ship that she catches bad guys with. Uh, a weird young girl named Edward, <laughs> they rescue from Earth, who is their computer hacker. She's kind of crazy. She's always singing. She like, sings everything. La da 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 da. Um, and their corgi dog, Ayn, who has got a, a chip implanted in him, and so he's a data dog. <laughs> and if you, you know, he's a corgi, and if you don't own a corgi, you'll want a corgi after watching this. It's so cool. Uh, the movie was called Heaven's Door, which involved a pandemic, an artificially created pandemic, hmm, but it made 2001. A little prescient, perhaps. And uh, there is, I'm a little frightened to say this, there is a live action a adaptation, American adaptation, scheduled for this year. It could come out on Netflix, and if it's as horrible as if it's as horrible as the one for Death Note, I, I am just terrified. But we'll see. We'll see what they do about it. So as far as the ratings, every one of these gets five years. Every one of the of the of my top ten. As far as the honorable mentions, I'd say four and a half, because you know some of those some of them are a little slow in places, a little less good pacing, but they're all fantastic. I this. If you want to get into anime and you like mature themes, you don't mind a little violence, a little horror occasionally, and you love sci-fi and fantasy, you couldn't do wrong to check out some of these, check out some of these shows. Again, not really recommended for children. <laughs> uh, so thanks for following with me on my rather long, but necessarily so, uh, show about my top ten anime picks. But ser best series of all the last 25 years. Uh, this has been the Steampunk Desperado. Thanks for joining me. Uh, please like and subscribe. That helps us a lot. Please check out my books. I'm going to put links on here. 
Uh, if you want to support me, you can buy some, and uh, I will be coming out with more books soon, which I will talk about on later vi videos. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future, and the present is extraordinary.